Hello everyone, George here, and today the topic is interrupts, specifically uh, timer interrupts. In the last video, we had explored using the standard timer, uh, timer one in this case. We uh, set it up, configured it properly, and then we created a while loop that constantly polled whether or not we had reached this value, I per S, which of course is calculated up here. And then every time we hit that mark, we reset the timer. If you don't do that, the timer is gonna keep incrementing until it rolls over. And then we, of course, flip our bits on lat A, which uh, is connected to our LEDs and causes them to go on and off and on and off. Wouldn't it be nicer, though, rather than having to pull for this information, if the system itself could automatically interrupt execution of whatever we're doing to handle specific events? And, you know, the name interrupt pretty much says it all. Uh, it interrupts what you're doing, calls a function for you that you get to create, and hopefully you execute a little bit of code and do some work. And then when the interrupt is done, you clear it out, and then you move on back into your main program and you continue to do work. So for this adventure, we're gonna need three data sheets. And we're actually gonna do things a little bit reversed. So first, of course, we always need our family data sheet open. Then we're gonna have the interrupts data sheet open, which of course makes sense. We're also gonna have the timer section open. It turns out when you're dealing with interrupts, you need to kind of bounce back and forth between the interrupt data sheet, as well as whatever kind of interrupt it happens to be. What kind of interrupts can you have? Well, you can have quite a few. There's an interrupt vector table, which is a table in memory, and you get to basically call whatever function you want to. It's gonna to point to whatever you wanna do. And as you continue to scroll down, you'll find out like the fact that the CPU has a priority status. And if the your interrupts also have a priority status, and if the CPU's priority status is higher than your interrupts, guess what happens? Your interrupt doesn't get to happen. Not only that, but you'll read about how you can have nesting interrupts, where one interrupt interrupts another interrupt. But for just this video, we're gonna focus on timer interrupts, specifically with timer one on the 16-bit timer. So if you scroll on down to section 8.4, this is the beginning of what you need to know. We have our interrupt control and status registers. Specifically, we're really gonna to wanna to look at IFSN, IECN, and IPCN. That's the interrupt flag status. That's the flag that basically says, hey, this thing occurred. Then there's the interrupt enable control register. If you wanna use an interrupt, you're gonna to need to turn it on. And finally, there's your interrupt priority control register, which is the priority of the interrupt, which you can change if you want to. Section 8.5 explains how we can actually initialize our interrupts and how we can go about setting them up. But really, the last thing we're gonna to wanna to look at in this document is this one right here, our register maps. So let's rotate this sheet. Now I'm gonna say, as a novice to this sort of thing, this information was a little hard to digest. But if we take a look over here, we've got all these different IPCs, IPO, IECs, IFOs, the flags and everything. And then we have the bits and what actually gets enabled and disabled right here. And I don't know about you, but I'm not having a very good time being able to read this table just off the bat. But I do understand that we've got our 16-bit field. We're gonna be turning them on and off. And that's how we're gonna be working with all of the uh, flags, interrupt controls, and the uh, enabling stuff. Now at this point, we're probably saying something along the lines of, okay, where's the timer? How do I know what the timer is? Well, that's why we gotta jump into the timer documentation. So let's now jump over here into timers. So right here in the introduction, it talks to you a little bit about the interrupt we're gonna be working with. And if we continue to scroll down, we're gonna run into exactly what we want, which is an example provided so we understand how to set everything up. Now remember, the actual timer bits aren't gonna have anything at all interesting for us to look at. We're dealing with interrupts, so it's a whole different set of registers. So here is the example they provide. Everything looks the same for the most part, and then we have this section right here. IPCO bits dot T1 IP, IFSO bits dot T1 IF, and then of course T1 IE, and hopefully we see this the priority, the flag, and whether or not the interrupt is actually enabled. And then we have this strange looking thing right here. What is this? Because we're gonna find that it's not documented anywhere. And in fact, if you wanna understand how to do this, you actually need to go to your compiler's information. Now under the developer help section, you'll be able to find information on how to write these. They're going to look a little bit different as you can see here, there's another notation apparently, but Look at this, this is also for XC32. At this time of recording this tutorial, I was unable to find information on our 16-bit version of the compiler. However, I'm going to assume that it's a similar format if we would like to look at that one and use it. That being said, what we have to do is write a function so that whenever our uh, interrupt occurs, guess what happens? Our function gets fired off. And from what I've read, it also recommends that you make the code within the interrupt as clean and concise as possible, but once again, 
how do we know which of these special function registers actually has anything to do with our timer if we don't know right off the bat or if we don't have an example? Well, that's what the register maps page is actually for. So if we come over here and look up our interrupts over here, we can see uh, the flag for each of the different timers. That being said, why don't we jump into code now and make this thing happen. So now, not only within timer one do we want to set up the timer, but we also want to turn on all that interesting interrupt stuff. Rather than rely on the example, let's try to get through this ourselves just by using this table right here, now that we understand what all these registers do. So let's enable it. So that is T1IE. Let's do IEC0, IEC0 bits dot, and timer one IE. And we're just going to set that to on. I'll uh, remember we could set the entire IECO bits thing if we wanted to with a single hex value, and that would be what? 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then this bit, and that's on, so that's 8. Now that that's enabled, we should probably set up our priority as well. Let's do IPC0 bits dot, and we're going to once again look at our sheet. Sorry if this is laborious. If you understand this, then continue to go ahead. I just want to make sure we understand where all this is coming from. And that's T1 IP0. Maybe we should take a look at priority for a second and get a general sense of how that's going to work with our, th our things, because we really didn't talk about that at all, did we? And if we take a look here, we have the usable priority level start at level one as the lowest and go to level seven as the highest priority. So let's make this a high priority. Why don't we just set it to be seven? So jumping back down to our special function registers and our timer manual, we'll notice that IPC0 has these three bits for setting the priority. So what? It, so that's up to seven, right? One, one, one. So rather than doing TP, can we do dot TP IO and set the entire thing as one value? That's three bits. So that would be seven. Now we just got to make sure that flag's been reset. So let's do, once again, looking over here for our flag. So our flag is for timer one, IFSO, T1F, IFS zero bits dot timer one F is equal to zero. Now, what we will do though, is follow the example's explanation of how to write this special function for us. Since uh, I wasn't able to find documentation on our particular compiler and how this works within the documentation online. So for that, let's go ahead and copy what they have. So we're going to start with void. It returns nothing. And then we have this uh, looks like some sort of an extension language here. Attribute underscore underscore something. I'm guessing only this compiler understands. We'll do double interrupt, uh, double underscore again. And then, of course, underscore underscore shadow. And I wonder if that has something to do with the shadow registers that I was reading about earlier. Interrupt, which, by the way, is a pretty badass name for for something. So the most important thing we need to do is uh, reset the flag. If you don't reset the flag, well, it, it stays set and uh, you don't want that. Uh, now we can do some work and the work we're going to do is the work we were doing down here. That is, we're going to reset our timer and we're also going to invert lat A. So there we are. And now rather than constantly pulling within our main loop, what's happening, we are going to be uh, allowing the interrupt to do the work for us. Let's go ahead and push this and uh, cross our fingers that everything works. Now, if you're doing this along with me, you're gonna notice that your on and off cycle is a lot larger. Why is that? Because we actually didn't set up the period bits for our timer up here. Remember before in the period, we we're going to FFFF, which is the maximum period that this thing can store. So it's gonna roll over and when it rolls over, that's when we're most likely getting this interrupt to fire, when this guy is equal to that value. So we're gonna to need to change the period so what do we want to calculate our period to be this time? Well, it's the same calculation we did up here, right? Just going back to that, bring up our calc. It's going to be our 8 million divided by 2, since it takes two of those cycles to actually perform an instruction. So we got 4 million now. And then what is our prescaler? Well, that's still 256. So let's divide that by 2, whoop, 256. And our value is 15625. I'm not a hex genius. So I'm going to use a hex converter. Let's see if I can't 15625. Let's go over here to programmer and in decimal 15625 in hex is 3D09. So let's put that in here, 3D09. And that should get us back to our one second interval. So let's go ahead and push that off. Now I'm getting an interesting warning and unfortunately I lost it. Warning, P 
PSV model not specified for timer one interrupt. Assuming auto PSV, this may affect latency. I actually don't know what that is. I'll have to look into that. All right, and if you're like me, you now have this thing blinking every second using an interrupt instead of uh, constantly pulling the value. Remember, if you enjoyed the video, give me a like. If you don't like it, you know, also tell me why. If you want more content like this, please consider subscribing. I'll see you all next time. So long, goodbye.